Welcome back to Live With, brought to you by Species Nutrition. I'm Dave Palumbo, and today we have a bunch of special guests here. A uh, good friend, Guru Amin Ali and uh, Jim Tamagini are joining us from Colorado, as well as our IFBB, or actually I should say North American super heavyweight second place finisher, Jeff Cherenfont, who uh, is going to be a guy to watch out for for sure he's got a great story he's been working with Amin uh, we also have Big Rod who's been on the show before uh, one of the freak of freaks from back in the 90s uh, joining us as well all right I need to know the whole dynamics here because it, it's confusing uh, Amin explain this whole relationship this family little affair we're having here <laughs> Rod's my longest and oldest best friend yeah you know I used known to him train him years ago yeah. yeah back in the day and we, we became really close friends and I saw the potential in him and I always thought he could be, you know, probably Mr. Olympia if he just focused on it, you know, because he was already throwing weights around more than Ronnie. He was already Ronnie's size, but he just, he didn't really want to compete. It wasn't what he wanted. And now it came to a time where Rod came across Jeff and Jeff wants to compete. And Jeff, you know, is asking Rod, for advice and Rod came to me to help him dial in for the North Americans and now help him, you know, continue on to the nationals and go on from there. We're hoping for the best at the nationals for sure. Okay. And uh, so Rod basically knew Jeff and, and they introduced Jeff to you. That's, that's the, and then of course, Jim, we've had on the show before. Uh, and now Jim, you, I understand you're living now out there in Colorado with the mean, you're renting a house together. What are you guys doing out there? What's the, uh, what's the game plan? We've been helping people solve their problems. We right. have a guy driving from New Jersey tonight, and then we have uh, six people next week. Wow. So you're doing these Ibogaine resets? Is that what, uh, what's going on? Like we did with Chris Bell, correct. Right. Now what's the success rate been so far in terms of like people who've come and done it versus people who've stayed sober and... and Thank God, so far there's been a zero recidivism rate, but we stay with the people. Yeah. We provide them with the aftercare. We provide them with everything they need to move forward with their lives. So it's been wow. really good. So far, so good. Life coaching, mental mental coaching, mental skills, meditation. Training. Cause training. A lot, bodybuilders. a lot of them are bodybuilders, yeah. That seems like a very uh, busy job you guys got because it, it takes a couple, I mean, it's a whole week, isn't it, procedure? Yeah. That's like one week on, two days off. Another week gone. Is that, is that how you guys are doing it? Okay. I guess it's good that you're both there because you kind of can tag team these guys, you know? That's exactly what That's we're exactly doing. exactly right. You hit, the, you hit the nail on the head. It's like your nannies for these guys for like five days. <laughs> right. Yeah. You couldn't do it alone. You just you'd go right. crazy. Right, so, right. Everybody's right. different. Everybody's an individual. Some people have problems that other people don't have. Hey, well, so. if you have any drug addiction problems, you can contact me. And I've sent some people to you already, so hopefully... Um, you're uh, solving their problems. Let's get to Jeff, because Jeff, uh, you you really impressed a lot of people. I'm sure Tyler, my uh, producer, will pull up your pictures from the North American Championships. Um, 
Nick Walker, we had him on the show. He, he was the heir apparent. He edged you out in the final outcome, won the super heavies, and won the overall, got his pro card. Talk to me a little bit about um, your journey, because you've had a tough journey. Where'd you come from? Give us a little background. I know you played football for four years. Uh, give <laughs> us your, your background into bodybuilding. So I'm originally, well, it's a pleasure to be on your show, first of all. Oh, thank you. I watch you all the time. But yeah. um, I originally, I'm originally from Miami. My parents are migrants from Haiti. Right. So I grew up Haitian. My first language was speaking Creole. I didn't learn English until I went to school. Wow. Really? Yeah. And, you, and you were born in Miami. That's crazy. I was born in Miami. I see that with a lot of Spanish people, too, even where I'm living here in Cape Coral. A lot of these young kids don't speak any English until they actually go to school. It's crazy. I actually had to go to Esau. So it was like English speaking for uh, other languages or something like, like that. Like you were born in another country in. almost, right? That's that's how you had to go with all those kids, right? Yeah, because the thing about Miami, the dynamic is that it's such a melting pot right. that if you stay in a certain area where they speak that language, you really don't have to know English. Wow. That's crazy. So the, the communication, you go to the store, you go to, to get a cab, everything, you speak in a different language. So <laughs> that's, not, that's crazy. So you, you, w w did this present as a handicap for you early on? I mean, did you feel like you were, you were not like smart or something like that, having to learn this other language? Oh, no, not at all. Actually, it was the opposite. The ability to speak two languages in that particular area had, right. had me a but beyond every anyone else, you know, <laughs> with the Spanish speaking dynamic, it was it was. I, I would definitely say it was not an event. It was it definitely was an event. Did, did you know Spanish too, growing up over there? Well, I didn't know Spanish, but I knew enough to get by. Right, right, right. Put it that put it that way. Was that a rough part of Miami that you grew up in as a kid? Well, uh, originally when my parents came here, you know, coming from another country, you migrate to where you know, most people from your country are. So it was a little rough, but then we fortunately were able to move out that area. So we got into a little bit of a better area. It wasn't great, but it definitely wasn't the worst of worst. Now, growing, coming up through school, obviously you played football. Um, you know, was that something that just came naturally to you? Did you enjoy it? I mean, did you do it to try to, you know, get out of that area and get into college? Or what was the impetus? Or were you just a good sports guy, you know? I was always pretty athletic. I didn't actually start playing football until I got into high school. Wow. So a lot of people down there, if you follow like the football culture in Miami, they start off as little children. Oh, yeah. From, from like six years old. Kiwis, and it's yeah. a big thing down there. But I didn't start playing football until I got into high school. So That's I played crazy. for four years. And fortunately, because of my athletic ability, I was able to get a scholarship. So And you played fullback? Well, in high school, I played a lot of positions. Because right. of my athletic ability, I was all over the place. They had your offense finally, and defense, yeah, I figured. Right. So when I finally got the scholarship to Morgan State, which is in Maryland, yeah, I played fullbacks yeah, and a little bit of tight end whenever they needed me to. Now, was that a, was that a culture shock going from, like, the, you know, Florida, warm weather, up to Maryland where you had winters and stuff like that? Definitely a culture <laughs> shock. Especially Definitely coming from Haiti, you know. <laughs> I, and, and the crazy thing about it, I tell people, I, I didn't know what a coat was. <laughs> and we only had jackets, like little little warm jackets. So when my cousin came, he's like, you need to buy a coat. I said, I have a coat. He's like, no, you need to buy a winter coat. <laughs> I never owned a pair of sweatpants. As much as I wear them now, I never wore them That's before. Funny. That was definitely yeah. a culture shock coming from. And, you know, being from the South, it's a little bit more, you know, slow. And, you know, everyone really wants to know each other and everything yeah. is cool. It appears totally different. Yeah. How'd you meet Rod? Well, luckily enough, we were training at a gym, and I just was looked over, and there's this humongous guy training. Of course, everybody's looking at him, yeah. and I'm over there looking at it. It took me a while to get up the, the courage to say something to him. Yeah. But eventually, once we met, it was just like a match made in heaven. You know, what, that's my guy. What year was that that you guys met? That was in 2014. Late 2014. Yeah, like at the ending, towards the yeah, ending of November, 2014. October. Yeah. 2014. So that, what was that, like right after you stopped playing football? No, I had stopped playing football for maybe like a year or two. Okay. So I was doing grad school. So I had, um, I was done grad school. So it was a couple of years after I had graduated. Now you have and a, I, you have an interesting degree. I mean, what, what do you practice? Uh, what are you, a physical therapy you do or something? Well, my, my major was in physical education, but the concentration was in physical therapy. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So, so the coursework I took was 
geared towards physical therapy. Very cool, very cool. But, but you're a corrections officer now. <laughs> how did you, yeah, how did well, you go from that to corrections? <laughs> You know, I had to keep the lights on and I had to make it work you. somehow, some way. So yeah. I ended up becoming a correction officer and I've been there since. Yeah. Now you're in a tough, you're in a rough uh, area too, huh? <laughs> yeah, it gets a little rough where, I'm, where I live at. It gets a little rough. Well, now, when you, when you go into these prisons, these guys see that you work out. And I know that, you know, unfortunately being in a, I had been in a prison situation uh, for, you know, five months of my life. They guys in prison respect the gym. They respect the bodybuilding. They respect that you know what you've done to develop your physique, probably more so than your intellect. Um, does that get you a little bit more? Uh, I guess respect from the um, from the inmates. I would say so, but at, at the same time, it also makes you a target. If okay. you understand how that goes, you know the biggest guy walking around, you know, but never anything physically. And that's why I was saying this: when you're working in a place like that, it's all mental. Mm -hmm. So they're behind the doors, you know, barking and saying things and whatever because they see me, and I'm like, I stand out. Right. But for the most part, there is a respect level that goes along with it as well. So right, right, right. I guess you, on how you see it, you got to let them know who's uh, who's in charge there. I guess at some point. Well, contrary <laughs> to popular beliefs, we don't go in there and just crack skulls and do all you those can't, things. You can't. You can't. Those guys are nuts in there. They'll, they'll, they'll come back at you, right? But sometimes it's necessary. Yeah, yeah. And you have to do what you have to do. But it's, it's not an everyday thing. Are it, you it with guys that like are murderers and stuff like that in there? Say it again. Are you with, are you with guys that are like murderers and, and, and you know, oh, violent yeah. criminals? Because of where I'm at, I've seen people with traffic violations and I've seen people with triple, triple homicides. Wow. The range wow. is like, it, it's, it's, Incredible. Yeah, that is crazy. So you um, you start working out, I guess, after football. Now, what, now let me ask you this question. You were obviously a very good at football. Um, did you ever have aspirations of going to the NFL after college? Oh, definitely. I feel like growing up in that situation, like I said, Miami, it's all about football. That's the way to become, you know, rich and, you know, famous. Right. So I definitely had aspirations of going to the NFL. I trained real hard. And I think that's where my love for training actually began. Did you get recruited uh, very heavily out of high school? Well, nah, not so much. At some point I did, but then when it came time for the real signing and things to really go down, I wasn't as recruited as I thought I was going to be. <laughs> okay, way. gotcha. Is it, it must be very competitive, I would imagine. Oh, very. Now, do they? When, when I, and I and I don't I don't really know the process. When they when they go to recruit you, do they make you like uh, do like you know forty yard dash times? Is that like important, or do they just watch you play? It's a combination of the both. Yeah. So there's a period of time where you know they watch your film, they study you, but then there's also times when you go to like little combines and they they test your speed, your agility, right. your ability to jump, basically your all around athleticism. Right. What was your best forty time? My best 40 time was a 4.6. Okay. I wasn't a super fast guy, but I made it work. Right, right. Well, it's also how you, you know, your agility on this on the field as well. Had you yeah, gone to the NFL, had now. you gone to the NFL, do you think you would have been a running back or do you think they would have put you in a different position? Probably a different position because now guys are running 4.3s, 4, threes, four, four twos, yeah, like it's nothing. It's nuts. So it's nuts. Yeah. Unless I would get a rocket pack on my back or something <laughs> like that, then I'd be a running back. <laughs> Now, what did you what did you weigh then when you were actually playing football? Um, I was about 240, 250. Right, that's a, that's a big guy. 6 foot 240 is big for, you know, football player. Uh, now when you started bodybuilding, how did you get into that? I mean, I know you always trained for football, but when did you say to yourself, "Hey, you know what? I might be pretty good at this. I I think I want to try to compete on stage." Well, it, it, it was always something that was interesting to me. You know, I followed bodybuilding and stuff like that. I never thought I would be a bodybuilder. So right after I graduated from college, um, one of my coaches was a powerlifter. So that's where I got a, my foundation as far as technique-wise and those things. So I, I, I powerlifted for like a year or two. Right, right. And did a, I, I only did one, one competition, but I was really heavy into powerlifting. So then after that was said and done with, one of my old friends, Gary Parks, I, I saw him out somewhere and I was like, you know what? I'm really thinking about doing some bodybuilding because it, it always intrigued me. But I'm like, now nah, powerlifting is over with. I might as well go for it. Right. So he introduced me to a gym and then the rest is history. What's the gym that you met Rod at? What was the name of that gym? 
Uh, I met J uh, Rod at Exile Fitness. Okay. Is that a hardcore gym? It's a real popular gym up here. Okay. Okay. Now, are you, uh, are you guys near Lavroni still? Do you ever see Lavroni at that gym? Well, we're no longer in that gym. Oh, you're not in that gym? Uh, okay. No. But I don't think Kevin's been there for a while either. Where does he he's train? still somewhat pseudo associated, but you know Kevin, you know what I mean? So, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so, yeah, we're no longer exile. Do you have a relationship with, with, with Lavroni? With me? Yeah. Well, yeah, I know Kevin. I know him very well. Right. Yeah. I mean, do you guys have like a like a like a friendship, or are you just like a hey? Yeah, a what's friendship. Up? I, I would call it a, a friendly rivalry. <laughs> 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 I never competed on that level, yeah. nor was I really driven to do it. But when we came to training, yeah, I used to put the punishment down. That's awesome. That's awesome. Now, <laughs> what was what? Well, now you did the North American. What was the first one you did, and then seventeen? Yeah, it was seventeen. Yeah. Right. We did yeah. the Maryland State in two thousand fifteen. And, and how, how'd you do with that show? Um, he won a super heavyweight there. Okay. Novice super heavyweight overall. Gotcha. And then he went into the um, open class and won heavyweight there. Wow. I mean, super heavy there. Impressive. Now, six foot, it's, sometimes it's hard to, to, to bring up your legs, and it's sometimes hard to fill out your frame. Obviously, you're a work in progress, and you've uh, from the pictures I've seen, you've made you've progress, progressively made improvements every single year. But you had a really, you know, you had a really tough time. It was, it was kind of almost like a, uh, it's almost unfathomable. You did the, the North Americans in 17, 18, and, and 20, and before every show, you lost a family member. I, I, I mean, I can't even imagine. What, what, I mean, it's like, a, it's like a bad omen almost. It's almost like, don't do that show anymore, Rod. I mean, I'm Jeff. <laughs> don't do that show anymore. In well, 17, after this year, I won't have to no, do it. No, yeah, yeah. In 17, you lost your mom, right? Right before that, that 17 North Americans? Yep. Were you placed fourth? Third, how, third. I can't even imagine how it is getting ready for a show after losing like a, a, a parent like that. How do you do it? It's really tough, but you know, it, it's also a, um, a outlet, you know, so it keeps me focused on something else. And the, the realization of the situation sometimes doesn't even hit me as hard as it probably should until after the show. Right. Because, you know, you, you for months and months you're focused on this and then, you know, you go through that situation and it's like, okay, well, I'm just going to focus on this. And then when the show is over, it's like, wow, this really happened. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? So it, it, it's worked for me in a positive way, at least uh, for a temporary relief of right. the um, stress. And, you know. You come the back the following year cool. in 18, where you placed, uh, what was that? Is that your second place finish? Oh, fourth place finish. I think that was fourth. And you lost your dad before that show. Mm -hmm. That's yep. crazy. You lost both parents. The, the, I mean, that's got to, I mean, I, I, I lost my mom when I was 14. I mean, that was brutal right there. I mean, but to lose both your parents, I mean, I, I, I'm so sorry to hear that. But I mean, ha, you know, you had to have very strong mental fortitude to be able to get, get back on stage and, and, and do it again, you know? And, you know, the beautiful thing about it is I could credit it to my parents because, you know, the, the sure. way they raised me and, you know, to always be strong and be focused. So it's kind of it's, it's kind of ironic, you know, yeah. that, that, that the, the, the things that they instilled in me, I was able to use in that type of situation. So it, it's, it, it's it's a beautiful marriage. It made sense. Mm -hmm. It's poetic, I guess. Yeah, you can say you come back in 2020 against Nick Walker, you finished second place, obviously, which to me is a win because Nick Walker was obviously the heir apparent in that, in that division. And your brother, who had COVID earlier this year, winds up, after recovering from it, passing away of a heart attack. I mean, three weeks before the show. I mean, w at that point, I mean, are you questioning, like, you know, your existence here? I mean, you have to be saying to yourself, why me at this point? I mean, right? I mean, how do you deal with that? that that's a tough pill to swallow. Well, well, like I said, because of my upbringing and uh, and, and faith based, like I don't I, I don't question why me. I, I actually I actually look at it as a grander scheme. Like these things are happening to me for a reason, mm -hmm. and it's inevitably for to make me stronger. I believe. Mm -hmm. So I don't I don't never I don't look at those situations as in oh woe is me. That's never been my my type of. Um, understanding of life and how things go it's just like everything is happening for the greater good right. and though you know losing family members is terrible I always under try to understand like what's the the greater picture uh, um and what's going on right right you know? yeah I, I i feel for you man i'm sorry to hear about your brother that's uh 
That's a tough yeah, one. That, you know that, what? that was pretty tough because if anybody knows me, me and my brother were like, like this. That was that's my best friend. Yeah. But only thirty four years of age too. You know, people don't realize COVID is is not just getting over the virus, but there's there's repercussions after the virus. You yeah. know, there's clotting issues with 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 COVID, and there's kidney and and heart you know involvement, and so. Uh, obviously, as well as lungs, so you got to really keep it. Once you get over it, it's not you're not out of the woods. Did you were you exposed to it at all when your brother had it? No, not at all. Okay, that's good at least. But but my brother had like his heart issues before that, so you know like everything. I think it may have exposed it. Uh-huh. My brother had slight issues with it. He had oh, been he hospitalized for that before gotcha. anything. So. All right, so let's let's bring Amin in now. I got you everyone up to snuff on your history, which is which is pretty impressive. Four years, you know, college, you know, ball, and almost went to the NFL. You lose your parents, three, pa- two parents and a brother, you know, leading up to this. Amin, ha- when you get involved with Jeff, what at what point of his prep for the North American did you step in? I think, I think Rob was it about five weeks before the show. Um, yeah, yeah, five weeks before the show, uh, Rod calls me up and, and sends me some pictures and asks and you know asks my opinion if he's on track, how's what does he look like? And then and then I started to find out about how strong this 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 man was. And I it blew my mind. when I saw his Instagram handle, by the way, he goes by uh, no breaks big bad bundy. <laughs> <laughs> Right, Triple B, this guy, and he's a threat. And I'm telling you, I, I we haven't seen, and I, and I really hope this goes viral for Jeff because we haven't seen this kind of training since Ronnie. He's squatting eight plates, ass to the calves for reps six weeks before the show. You got you got so, that on the Instagram? See if you can pull that up, Tyler. Pull it up right now. You're going to see insane stuff. He's, he deadlifted nine plates on each side. Why? I, mean, well, I didn't realize that. Oh, my God. rolling five plates on each side for reps like it was candy. Oh, so that's why you and Rod have this kinship, huh, in the gym? Yeah. Because they're the strong. Uh, Dave, we yeah. are a pack, my man. <laughs> we are a pack. What? I sit there, I sit there about, you know, we're not, every, we're not for everybody. We we're, train do the 1990s, one. 1980s style. Heavy and high. What's Big Bad Bundy mean? Where, where'd you get that name from? <laughs> so Bundy is basically uh, from my Haitian heritage. So Bundy is probably like loosely translated like the tough guy, the big guy. Like wow. the guy at the – he's he, it's just basically like King Cooper at the end of Mario. <laughs> That's the guy you have to face to get the win. Yeah, so you know, the if, Bundy part is from my car, and then Big Bad Bundy is just <laughs> – if you would have told me, I mean, if he would have told me that he's brothers with Akeem, Akeem Williams, I would swear the two of them look exactly the same, and they, they're basically both just as strong as each other. Hey, you know, I think Akeem is, uh, is he Haitian also? I no, I think he's Jamaican. Jamaican. He's Jamaican. He's Jamaican. I think Max Charles is. Max, Max Charles is. Yeah, Charles. yeah, Max is. Yeah. But Akeem and him look similar. They look like they could be brothers. They have. They even look alike. You think but so? <laughs> a little bit. I think if you did, if you had, if you had no hair, you know, like he does, you would, you would look. Yeah, let's let's talk about his Just hair. The same smile. Uh, Justin grown his hair for thirteen years. It goes down. Uh, he's he's about five eleven and a half. Is that right? Five eleven, six foot. About six Take foot. Take my me. It goes down to his butt. In bodybuilding, you want to round down, uh, Jeff. In, in 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 other sports, you round up. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. But but it goes down. It, it, as as tall as he is, it goes all the way down to to the top of his rear, to the very lower part wow. of his back. We haven't seen hair like that since Kai Green, and his is much more impressive. Well, Kai like, Green's is not real. You know, Kai Green's is fake. <laughs> yeah. So Jeff's got real hair. That's cool. That's the real deal. This yeah. guy's the real deal. The weights he lifts are real. It's impressive. And I'd be, I mean, be honest with you, because I mean, I lost Caden, and that that was really hard for me. But I mean, he just lost his brother, and and when it got down to crunch time, down to do the key, he, he was in Miami three weeks before the show, burying his brother, wow. and then he flies he flies right back to go zero carbs, hundred reps, the whole. My whole hell week that, that's been coined hell week, he went through the whole thing under Rod's supervision. The two of us worked together. Rod and I worked together. And, you know, Rod uh, is brutal in the gym. There's no trainer, no trainer that's going to push you like Rod because when Rod says, 
two more. You're going to do it just because his voice is so deep. <laughs> you that if you don't do those two reps, he might punch yeah. you or something. And what? that's even worse. Yeah. <laughs> Jeff, <laughs> so you're I'm, failure if Rod's helping right, you. Right, right. Jeff, how much muscle did you, what did you gain from, uh, what did you weigh at 2018 North Americans? 2018, what was that? 66. To, uh, 266 down like on weigh-ins. But you were, I'm sure you weren't as lean. No, no. See, that was the difference. So yeah. it's it's a different kind of weight. Yeah. Put it yeah. that way. Okay. I mean, how big can this guy get? I mean, he's got a huge frame. What do you what do you think would be the ideal weight for this guy to really be as a, do a dominant pro at? Competitive weight? Yeah. I think he could compete easily in the two eighties. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. Yeah, easily. And I and right now you're two ninety what, Jeff? I'm about two ninety five. The pin five right now. We just competed at he was two seventy point eight at the weigh-ins. You know, two sixty uh, three on on stage. That's that's the magic that happens the last few weeks when I suck him in and pull all the water. Right, but you want to see him two eighty on stage and suck dry, right? Right. Eventually. That's Eventually. Coming. Yeah. That's coming. Right. This this, this rebound in itself and the fact that Rod's really targeting his back and Rod knows exactly what to do is. I mean, he's a he's a back animal he knows exactly what to do to bring up jeff's back they're we got special workouts we're going to be posing three times a week he's going to be doing the stairs three times a week as of now so you're going to see shredded glutes like like pro caliber shredded glutes i have enough time rod has enough time jeff is motivated it, it couldn't be better and we're gonna i mean literally posing every every day but on really posing sessions three times a yeah. week and we're Ten weeks out now. Yeah, ten weeks out now. Well, the good so the good thing is that you know, with a work ethic like that, and and when you lift, and Rod, you could attest to this. I can I can talk directly to you. Mm -hmm. Ronnie Coleman is a perfect example. When you lift heavy weights and you got great genetics, and you eat right, and you got the right people advising yeah. you, you grow. You go grow. <laughs> and you grow dense, big, round muscle. That's what you do. And you can't help but grow. I mean, look at the yeah. guys who lift the heaviest. The, the, you know, the Akeem Williams and the Ronnie Coleman's and the Dorian Yates. They, they got muscle to show because of it. Um, there's not many people that is lifting the weights that you are lifting, Jeff, in the gym. I mean, is that are you a naturally strong guy, or do you notice that as you've gotten bigger, your, your weight, your just your strength has increased exponentially? I think it's a combination of two. But you know, training with Rod ever since I got with Rod, like my my strength gains have jumped exponentially like because he's he's a big proponent of straining training hard and heavy right so where a guy would do 10 reps with a moderate rate broad pushes you to put heavy weight on there for 10 to 15 so you, you wouldn't have grown that big without rod pushing you into that uncomfortable zone and that's important but you you think about it dave you have to be if you're trying to bring about any type of change in a physique there's other ways you can do it, but yeah. those people don't last long, do they? No. So what we're saying is, so I think it comes down to a scheme, constantly pushing that ramp a little bit. Yeah. Now, granted, you can't go hard every day in and day out. You have to cycle it. Yeah. Pull back a couple of weeks, let's go back in. You know, yeah. it's something that you have to be looking at an individual and say, okay, fine. We, we, we're we pushed now. Everybody's a little, a little ragged right now. But that's the good thing about a train like we, we train. We train with a group of guys. And like when he came back from Florida, when his situation was what it was, what do we do? Do we wrap our arm around, and give a kubaya moment, and say, "Hey, bro, you got a shoulder?" <laughs> you know, like that. What's the guy CT Fraser said? Sorry. Yeah. You, you'll sit. Yeah, <laughs> get under that bar. But you know what? Let's go. I, but that's the about it. It's a pack mentality. One's yeah. up, the next one shoots them down. Let's keep it going, pushing. I'm a huge proponent of that. You got to find someone who's stronger mm -hmm. than you. And that's going to push you out of your comfort zone. Otherwise, you're going to stay in that zone and you're not going to make improvements. I had a group of guys that I worked out with when I was coming up too that were stronger than me. And maybe they didn't have better physiques than me at some point, but they were stronger than me. And they made me do stuff that I didn't want to do. Because who the hell wants to get under you know, a squat bar with 700 pounds? It's, I'll do six plates for, for, for six reps. No, no, no. You're going to get under 700. And you're going to do it for two reps. Well, I don't really want to get under there. And you know what? That forces new growth in your body. And yes. that's, that's what you got to do all the well, time. Oftentimes we have a situation where a guy says, man, okay, coach, that's, that's eight plates on the squat rack. I've never <laughs> done that before. But my point is, is that how do you know? Yeah. Right. The time is right. You got spotters. You got the right training. Yeah. Let's give it a go. Right.
Right. Next thing you know, they do it. They look at you like, oh my God, I did it. Right. That's my job. I'm going to think for you. No, yeah, but you, you become the doer. Let me think for you. It's very important. I always say that. Yeah. You got to have a good, even if you don't have a group of guys, you got to have a good training partner who's willing yeah. to push you and be there to, to be able to spot you because. Yeah, I've I, I've gotten on the bars where I really didn't trust the spotter too much because I was in a foreign gym and I just uh, didn't go as heavy as I wanted to because I was afraid I was going to get crushed with the weight and there would be no one there to, to pull it off me. So it's great that he's got you and all the other guys there on a regular basis mm -hmm. pushing him. You know. Yeah, and that's the great part because I train with the group that we train with. There's a guy who benches more than me. There's a guy who does leg curls more, and then we have a group of <laughs> ladies who go at it really hard. So even when I need some inspiration, right. I can look over and see the group of ladies working hard and I'm ready to go. It doesn't take much to motivate me, but I could always find it. Or, or David will be the situation like, man, what you gonna train with the girls today? <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> oh yeah. You know, we, don't spare, we don't spare feelings in this group. Go over there right. and train with the ladies, baby, because we're doing something different over here. Right, you, right. You have a choice. Jeff, uh, who is your, uh, if you look into bodybuilding world now, uh, what, what physiques do you like? Like what, like what guys do you admire and say, hey, that's, that's a guy I want to look like? Or, that, or even maybe in the history of bodybuilding, what, you, what were your favorite bodybuilders coming up? Well, if we would say right now, yeah. I'm, a, I'm a big proponent. Like I love shape and roundness. So I would like, I would say Sean Roden, but my favorite bodybuilder of all time right. is definitely Flex Wheeler. Okay. I feel like his body proportions and his muscle bellies, I think he just had a, a beautiful physique. Right. And you know, Ronnie was amazing. He had the wow factor. You can never go on without mentioning him, but Flex Willard was always my favorite bodybuilder. Now, if you had to compare your physique to someone, like who, like who you try to emulate when you watch videos, like who do you try to imitate and steal stuff from and incorporate into your routine, who would you say you think your body uh, looks like the most? Oh, I don't know. I would say that I take I take place. parts from everyone that I see, like even the way that I pose when I do my last spread. I I, I learned that from watching Brandon Curry right. of all people. Like, and that's a, you know, he's a newer guy in the whole grand scheme of things. And you know, my side chest. I, I've just taken things from everyone that I've seen, so I wouldn't just narrow it down to one person. Right. And I don't think my body, my physique is this similar to any one type of person. So, gotcha. I'm just trying to make. Uh, the what I have worked for me the best that I can. Right, right. Well, I want to, you know, thank you for coming on, Rod. Thanks for joining us. Amin, you, Jim, over there, good luck with the, uh, and, and you're doing some great work out there in, in Colorado with the Ibogaine treatments. I appreciate all you guys coming on the show all the time. And uh, good luck at the Nationals because, you know what, uh, it's a crazy year, but sometimes crazy years result in, in great results. So I, uh, you've uh, had a lot of hardships you've overcome. Uh, I like your your never quit mentality, and I think that the, at the, in the end of the day, you're going to come out on top. So good luck to you. Thank we'll you. I appreciate that. Put his, we'll put his Instagram in the description so people can see his. Heavy they, training. Yeah, they saw it. We we had it up here. We would put flashing pictures and Instagram oh, cool. stuff up all all show right long. So, uh, if guys, if you want to check him out, go go hit a go like his page, and uh, if you want to also contact Amin, what's the best way, Amin? GuruAminAli.com. There you go. Uh, you got a whole website, uh, I guess, dedicated to um, helping people who have substance abuse problems. So check it well, out. No, I, that's that's my personal website. Then oh. we have the Red Pill Reset. So All right. again, yeah, that's the shirt that yeah. uh, Jim's got on there. The Red that's Pill the shirt Reset. That's Jim's got on. That's the Ibogaine. That's what we're doing. It's not just drug addiction. It's depression. Okay. People are trying to get off antidepressants. It, 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 the gambling addiction. gambling addiction. That's another one too. So yeah, yeah we've how, did, how does Ibogaine cure gambling addiction? That's what I want to know. Psychological. Yeah, it's all psychological. It resets those receptors. It resets you. Don't, you have no longer have the compulsion that you usually have. It, it gets rid of compulsion. I, Listen, I, sex addicts too. People that want that are in that uh, have an addiction to pornography. Yeah, it gets rid of the craving to want to the compulsion to want to watch pornography. Great, great. I know a couple of guys. I'm going to send over to you. <laughs> It's very level-headed, you know what I mean? Some people aren't ready for it. Like, I don't know if Tony Huge is ready for it, right? <laughs> well, he wants to. He needs he, a reset. He, he probably would do it just for it. the experience. Right. He tells me he wants to do it, and we're, we're planning on flying to Thailand whenever, you know, they open up. Or the may, actually, maybe he doesn't want to do it. Maybe that. Maybe he doesn't want you to reset him. Then he might uh, be bored with his life if you reset yeah. him. 
I'm, I'm wondering the same thing. It's like you always said, what's this guy's life? It's really interesting. So we'll see what happens, whether it's going to change him in a good way or in a bad way or in a good and bad way. Yeah. Who knows? <laughs> All right. Well, guys, that's going to be it for today. Uh, I'm Dave Palumbo with, uh, for Amin Ali, Jim Tamagini, Big Rod, and, of course, Jeff Charenfont. We'll see you next time. Thank you, Dave. Thanks, Thank Dave. You. Thanks, Thanks.